follow the wiki page so uh, yesterday me, myself and Christian updated the wiki page uh, with the our release uh, our goals for the for the next release and then we'll be following that uh, looking at the stuff you already did and the stuff we still need to do not all of them need to be done by the release so it's not so doesn't look so bad and then after we do that, then we can go back and discuss uh, the points we are missing. Okay, so the stuff we already did uh, for the interpreters, we we were able to remove every bit of old shit from the archive. So we now have only Ruby 2.1, which is the latest upstream, and I think we are really good for Jesse. Uh, I, th I think the, the interpreter package itself is a lot better. It's very, it's, I, th I don't think there's any demo specific patch anymore. I mean, also upstream is a lot saving nowadays, so that's good. Uh, we also made sure that the upgrades from Wizzy doesn't don't break because uh, on Wizzy we still allowed people to change the default interpreter using. Uh, update alternatives and that turns out to be very dangerous and very error prone so we removed the option to do that and also uh, there are some uh, alternative technical measures on the Ruby defaults package to make sure that user being Ruby is always what we want it to be so and then the upgrade works so we figure out how to make sure that even if you don't have the Ruby meta package and you have something that uses Ruby, when you upgrade you get the right package in place and everything works. So that's done. On the packaging side, we just released... about the interpreters, at some point there was a discussion I think with Maga about uh, not forcing the removal of mm -hmm. Unity's Ruby 1.8. Yeah, that's, that's done. Okay. So if you if you have Ruby one H, it's well, it's not going to be removed behind your back. So it will stay there. Just won't work with anything provided by Debian anymore, mm -hmm. but it will stay there. Uh, I, I expect it will uh, it, it will go away later. No, it, it, it went away from the archive already. Yeah, yeah, it just oh. if you already. But you were not completely. Yes, yes, it will stay there if you have it. Makes sense. I mean. If you have explicitly installed it and not as a de um, alternative dependency of Ruby meta package, mm -hmm. so it will just stay there. Uh, and so on the packaging side, we just released it. Uh, it, it was very nice work by uh, Cedric. Uh, integration of auto package tests. So all our packages now, uh, freshly created packages, have auto package test integration by default. And for new packages, it's very easy just running gh make Ruby on the existing package and it will add the missing files. And uh, maybe we'll be able to run the auto package test for every package, even without uh, new source uploads. So I'm going to figure out how to do that with the auto package test maintainers. So even though we want to do source uploads anyway to make sure that everything is in place, we would be able to benefit from automated tests all the time, fi more 500 packages for free. So I'm probably going to do that. And on the coordination side, we both uh, tasks done by, by Cedric. So thank you very much, Cedric, if you are listening. So we are having more or less monthly meetings on IRC for reviewing progress and, and looking of looking over uh, painting stuff and discussing and that's very that's going that's being very helpful helpful. We also had a team sprint in uh, January in Paris, very nice as well. It was uh, co-located with the Paris Mini Deb Conf, very nice, and we probably want want to do that again because it's, it's so useful, there's where we figure out how the upgrade stuff was going to work. So that's, uh, that's a lot of stuff, and now there's stuff we still need to do on the interpreter side. Uh, 
uh, I had an idea to make RubyGens integration, uh, make RubyGens installed to the home directory by default if the user doesn't have permission to write to slash var slash lib slash gems, whatever. So that's, we, we'll, go, we'll go back to these items I just mentioned them very quick. We need to figure out uh, what to do for multi-arch, so the dependency chains that mix uh, Arch all and Arch any packages, we have to have the right flags there to make sure it works with multi-arch. Uh, we need to check upstream support for Ruby 2.1 and make sure we are good for the lifetime of Jesse. Uh, I would like to have feedback on an experiment I posted on the mailing list a few days ago called Ruby Standalone, which is a way of installing the Ruby interpreter from Debian and being able to use that without any of the Debian package. So if, if your upstream uh, has versions that are incompatible, I mean, if your upstream project, like, you want to install a web application like GitLab or uh, this course, and then the, you cannot satisfy the dependencies with Debian, you can just use that thing to use the interpreter from Debian, but the package from RubyGems. Uh, we need to uh, decide whether we want to backport Ruby 2.1 to Wizy, or if in general we want to keep backports of the latest interpreter for the latest table, and how to do that without breaking everything. Uh, and if it's useful, if people want to have a uh, backport of the latest uh, head commit for upstream interpreter. Uh, there are also uh, to do items on the alternative interpreters. I didn't see much movement on this front, to be honest. So I don't know if it's gonna, something's going to happen there. What's the status? I, my impression is that uh, Rubinion seems to be compatible with most things, but it ju just didn't catch up. Maybe because MRI is doing much better in with the non-Japanese developers, so people are getting <coughs> inside the core team more easily, and it seems to be working. I, even people who work on Rubinion are there, so. My, and then there's a, something like Rubinus 2.0 that's like changing everything and like being handled like an experiment. So uh, I was working on the Rubinus packaging and I, uh, to be honest, I'm not very interested anymore. And for JRuby, I have no idea. Okay, uh, about finishing the transition to new Ruby policy, we have to. Um, Finish the last few packages. I think it's, it's very, uh, very few, right? Yeah. Uh, mostly mounting packages that haven't transitioned. Yeah. Uh, I think that's mostly because we don't have uh, real written policy documentation. So okay. We find people to commit to this. Um, yeah. So, so there are some Ruby packages. And that brings us to the next point, which is updating Ruby policy package. I mean, uh, in, in the in the context of the Auto package test uh, development. We ha we that specification is going to move to the Debian policy, and also I think we should probably do the same and maintain all this. Like the pure policy is already there, so we should probably do that as well. And on the packaging side, a couple of. Uh, yeah, we have to like the fake auto package test integration to make sure we can have auto package test support even before uploading the 500 source packages we maintain. Uh, there's a lot of bugs to fix on Gentle Dead and most of them are good entry points for people wanting to start contributing. So most of the stuff is not hard. Uh, there's to do items in the Git repository is probably uh, very outdated. And also, we need a still a solution for automatically build and ship developer docs. I think uh, Pear was working on that, and I, I don't, I'm not sure on the status. On the coordination, uh, organizing a periodic, a periodic sprint. 
So Cedric added last night a note here. If you want to do ne the next one close to the DevConf UK or the mini DevConf UK or Fosden. And code review. I'm not sure yeah, what this I means. Edit that. And, um, there have been some discussions around that come here that they should use more code review. Um, and I see that on Hackathon Access list, we regularly do some sort of code review because we have many people in the team that can't upload themselves. Mm -hmm. And the question is um, would any tool like Garrett to help us do that? Um, well, I personally don't do any code reviews on Pikachu VX, um, but people have been good on that. Yeah. I've been using Gary that work, it doesn't work so well for the web packaging because well, it's difficult with all the branches and stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's the best tool, or maybe we can use it just to document exactly all we need to use it. Mm -hmm. It's quite easy to mess things up. Yeah. Uh, there are a bunch of outreach action here, like doing PR basically, creating a task cell test for Ruby development. We still didn't have anyone doing that. Um, and a bunch of things about documentation. Basically, we suck at maintaining documentation, so we have. Yeah. So, okay, so yeah, we went over the list. Now we can, do we discuss the easy things first mm -hmm. or the yeah. hard things right. first? There was uh, a little bit of feedback from IRC. Uh, both to you, I think, I don't know how to say that. It's really said that uh, Rubinius uh, is not a master package because it was split into many gems. Um, Right, there yeah. was that. So, and somebody also asked the data to speak closer to a microphone. Yeah. And he replied on IRC. And then maybe, H maybe you can G G grab said that a sprint uh, before the Jesse freeze would be cool. Like before the Jesse freeze, that's, uh, that's a nice little shortcut. difficult. <coughs> that the mini that point you is in October? November? November. 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 So that's October. right on top of the freeze. Yeah. So yeah, about the about the sprint, you maybe maybe we can discuss that first. Uh, sorry, not sure at all. Uh, I know it is. Uh, it is. We just don't have speakers, yeah, but it's on for the stream. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm wondering if it sends the right message to organize a sprint uh, in November if it freeze uh, in early November. Yeah. It might be better to. Uh, I'm not sure the status of the Ruby team regarding RC bugs. Uh, Oh, yeah, I, I, I don't think we're too bad. Even this size. The one thing we are actually missing. So for our CBEX, mostly uh, the one thing we are missing is like grades. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not on the list. Uh, can you comment on the state of it? Yes. So Rails 4 is on sta unstable in testing. Uh, we are just missing one package in the new queue to make sure the smoke test for Rails pass back to back. So, and that is, it's not even a, a very important package, it's like a documentation generator, but uh, it's required by the default gem file that Rails creates. Uh, I should probably talk to Paul <laughs> here to see if he wants to do more new processing <laughs> during DevCon. Uh, yeah, but then, quite yeah, I know. You, you can just, if, if you need a specific package to go through new, you can just go to him and explain why it's important that this one goes through new. Okay. Yeah, so when that's in, then Rails 4 is, the full stack is completely fine. Uh, another good news, last night I was able to make uh, Redmine work with Rails 4. So we will need, uh, I think, three or four packages to in the new queue and new upstream versions of all the three or four packages, but Redmine is working. So, yeah, then we, we I think Redmine is the main dependency, Rails dependency we have, reverse dependency, so we, we should be fine by the time of, of the freeze. Yeah, so then for the sprint, what it works for? 
Mm. Yeah, I think I think we have to look at the maintain a dashboard, see the volume of RC bugs, and if there's lots of them, maybe it's useful to have a sprint, e even if it's close to the sprint, to the freeze. I was wondering if we couldn't just do some kind of uh, automated uh, gems to dev uh, website. Uh, I think there's one for our packages mm -hmm. uh, that converts uh, from airplane to uh, their packages. And maybe that's something that would work quite well with the current state of gems to dev. So generate dev files with all gems. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, some of them will be broken and will require manual tuning from the sysadmin. Uh, that would be a nice way to uh, enforce or to, to push them to each uh, and make them realize that uh, it's, a, it's a valid alternative compared, compared to the chance. So yeah, there was something doing that in the past, but I, I, I think Gunnar did a blog post on something related to that. I, I think it was some company that Yes, I had a service for that, but I, I think they disappeared. They disappeared. They, yeah, Miriam, you're right. They were trying to do the whole. Uh, uh, well, it was not yet uh, Ruby Gems, however, it was the previous iteration of it. Mm. But, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe six years ago or so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we. Yeah, that's something that seems to be doable. Again. If that works, does that work, Kurt? Yes. I can't hear anything. Yes, yes, yes. Cool. I'm doing salt in that room. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Should we go yeah. Yes. Sorry. Well, uh, no. Thinking about this uh, idea by Lucas, if we start doing a, a automated <coughs> gem to them website. It may even be set in a, a, a deb, a, a, like a, in a, a repository way, as an aptar a repository. Oh yes, of course. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe on demand, you, you request one gem and then it, it gets other. Well, that's yeah, a bike sharing. I think in the, the Ruby gems are pretty big. We don't want to do everything. Yeah, there's loads of crap there also. And also, you know, different versions of gems. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we don't want to convert all of the, the Ruby gems and also, uh, you know, at different applications are going to have, uh, you know, many different um, re version requirements for Ruby gems. So we would al also have to mm. maybe do all of the versions, you know, so that gets even worse. And also, I don't know if how frequently we should like look at everything and maybe throw some packages out of the archive because dead of stream or superseded or not recommended because I think we have a bunch of like leaf libraries that actually we could just ditch uh, probably is to yeah maybe uh, after after the freeze or so I don't know yeah I think there's, there's a that's a general problem does anybody know how other teams do that. I mean, spotting that up scenes, just some someone doing the work all the time. Or <coughs> I don't think there is a non-manual way to do that. Yeah, well, there are several metrics we could uh, take to help us uh, decide on that. For example, looking at uh, popcorn scores, uh, uh, crossing that with last upload times. I mean that that can start pointing to well something maybe unmaintained, not surely. Okay. 
show should we go to the list yeah. now okay uh, so James Tao to home directory if the user is not root so the only uh, we and Christian discussed this and the only problem that seems to happen I mean, it's not really a problem but it's an issue is that it makes us different from other OS's so Fedora does that by default since some time already so if you're not root and you do jam install it will install to your home directory by default but uh, can you explain what happens with bundler yeah. so the main concern is basically bundler which um, on other OS's except like Fedora probably um, notices that you're not root and if you cannot write into the system jam directory it will spawn sudo for you and it will see if that works and if it doesn't then it will give you a nice error message that says yeah you need to install into a non-system location and you need to do that and that um, I think uh, most of the like Rails tutorials and whatever on the internet basically assume that you can just run bundle install something and then you will end up with the gems in the system location and the Gem stop file, the bin stop files in user local bin, so everything will be in your path afterwards, and I think that would break. Uh, I've always used Bundler with the, uh, I think it's like vendor flag, the one that puts every uh, dependencies bundle needed in a single repository. Can we make that the default and problem solved? I mean, the idea that these things called sudo is a bit... I, I hate it. So yeah, that's actually a fair point. Uh, I agree that it's... Um, you know... Um, it should, it in an ideal world, it shouldn't run sudo, but... Um, You know, it's the way now. Didn't uh, they didn't they add this pseudo thing exactly because of us? Uh, no, I think because they if, if every, everyone else uses their RVM, they install to the home directory anyway, and we are probably the, the only <laughs> the ones pushing for <laughs> installing to the system location by default. I know on um, at least OS X. Um, it will default to the system location if you do not use RVM. Okay. Now I don't know how many people use Bundle without using RVM. So if you have feedback on that. I mean, this um, also plays into the question if we should we have Ruby standalone, should we have uh, Ruby backports? Because if nobody is ever using the system interpreter for doing development work, then we can just stop caring for these things. So what are you using? So my development platform is Debian. And I'm, I'm producing software that I want to get packaged in Debian because I don't want to have to jungle with you know, updating versions all the time. Uh, so, I'm, I'm, if I can, I'm actually trying to uh, to target stable. And if I can't, I'll target packages that I think I can backport. Um, that's a very specific position of someone doing a bit of upstream Ruby development, but it's also mainly a deep developer. Uh, but I believe it is also <laughs> uh, a way to not have so many headaches. Yeah, that, that's what I do too. Um, I don't think it's useful to backport the interpreter. Uh, but, yeah, I don't know. I, I, um, using, uh, I, I don't know, using, so I, I really don't like RVM also because, meh. But uh, the bundler with the, the vendor uh, directory is like a mini RVM and it's like, like building a shitload of tons like of stuff in in your home. 
it was like a reasonable compromise to me. I don't know. Other Wh when you do that with Bundler, does it, if there are packages already installed system wide, does it duplicate those packages in your? Okay. Okay, so uh, in our case for development machines, we sometimes use Ruby. If it's, it's, it's possible, we take it from the operating system, from Debian or from CentOS. But there are plenty of applications uh, still not being fully supported by Ruby 2.1, for instance. That's why uh, very often we compile from scratch Ruby, because it's not really difficult. And then we use Bundler and we never use gems from uh, uh, operating system from Debian. We we always do it on the fly. And even in production, um, for every release, we uh, do <coughs> bundle install. Uh, so when we switch between the releases, it's really safe because if I change Ruby version, uh, Ruby gem version and I release new version of application, I want to have the full set of gem gems in the application, in the new release of my application directory. And it means that if something breaks, I can really quickly switch back to the, uh, to the old release. Huh? If I understand you right, you're not using our bundler then? No. So in, in our case, uh, we have a Debian-only infrastructure, and we're using actually um, the Debian package right now and uh, plus a couple of patches for the um, garbage collector, which will be unnecessary in 2.1 as far as I understand. Mm. Uh, so we, uh, we're really trying to push the developers towards using as many system packages as possible, as many distribution packages as possible, but that's not always um, the case. They use Bundler. They have locks on specific game versions, which is something like inherently, almost inherently incompatible with the way we do versioning in Debian. Yeah, right. So I think that it's very, very difficult to provide uh, like packages that can satisfy everyone and get rid of Bundler. Uh, as far as the, the backport is concerned, um, I think it would ease transition to Jesse so that we could eventually uh, start switching to Ruby 2.1 before upgrading the whole system to Jesse and see that the application works. But I don't know if that would be reason enough uh, for the overhead of backporting mm -hmm. things. I mean, for us it would be perfect because we could get rid of the uh, custom patches we have right now in place for the garbage collector because they're not needed in 2.1 anymore. Um, but I'm not sure how many people would actually use a Ruby interpreter from backports right uh, now. I mean, I could um, try the backport. I, I, I haven't seen what uh, actually is required to backport. I, I suppose we have to make it work with update alternatives and so on in order to be compatible with um, Wheezy versions right now. Um, I could invest some effort there. Okay. Yeah, our idea was to not integrate with Ruby out energies at all and just create the Binary is the 2.1 prefix suffix, okay. and then if you want to use that by default, you can just create things in user local bin. Because on Wizzy, most of the binaries, uh, most of the binaries still use user bin and Ruby as shebang lines, so it's going to use whatever Ruby you have on your path. And since none of the Ruby libraries on Wizzy will support Ruby 2.1, then everything will, will explode. For just your uh, in a better position because most binaries already use user bin Ruby, so they will use whatever Ruby would say they should use. So the, the, the idea of the backport, if we do that, is to not provide in the path by default. In the path. So maybe we can provide some directory with the theme links already made that you can add to your path or call directly if you want. But we are not planning to integrate with how easy the auto with Ruby because that's going to break everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you said you always use uh, Ruby from source? Uh, depends. I mean, we use uh, uh, from scratch or Bitmapping uh, Ruby. 
but it, it's just built, everything is built from scratch. We don't depend on the operating system. It's mostly because uh, we want to be independent on, um, we, we, may, we, we are running different applications, Ruby applications, and some of them, they still use Ruby 1.8, some of them 1.9, mm -hmm. et cetera. So it's just safer for us uh, for now. So for instance, what I would expect from the uh, from Debian or from Linux distribution is just to have a Ruby interpreter, like really well done and different versions so I can switch. And I don't care that much about Ruby gems, gems in, in general because I can always use them with bundler, right? And I don't know if other but guys uh, use... But you uh, do care to have the interpreter from the OS? Uh, I mean, I if could possible. use it. Uh, if possible, yeah. I could use it, yeah. yeah. And in development, uh, I, try to, uh, I, try to, I try to do it. Because it's not one part is web development, other part is, I mean, we Ruby developers, we also build some tools uh, in Ruby. Mm -hmm. So I, I, w I want to have uh, Ruby in the system, from the system. Yeah, so the, the idea of Ruby standalone is to be able to install Ruby from the OS and then even if you have stuff like Vagrant or Redmine or anything else that's a Ruby application packaged by Debian, you can still use your application and your application won't see any of the dependencies of those guys. Like Chef brings a, lot, a whole lot of dependencies and then if you use Ruby standalone, it will use the interpreter on the system, but that interpreter will not see all the other libraries installed. So then you have a clean environment for applications. And that's that's something I would use myself if I have, for instance, to contribute to some upstream project that has completely crazy versions. Then I could use that because I, I don't want to be building Ruby from source every time. And then just have a clean environment there and then use install whatever your upstream needs for me to write a patch. Okay. Um, just a final note. Um, when we started this, um, anyway where I work, we, we're basically running a big Rails application. Mm -hmm. uh, that's our main business. So when we um, started some years ago, we were using Ruby Enterprise, which meant completely out of tree stuff. The fact that we now only have a single patch on top of the Debian package, which will also probably go away with 2.1, mm -hmm. I think is a very big success for Debian right now. And I mean, um, for us, I, I would like to be able to use only system packages. It's um, clear for us. For the security support, then, because there's no reason to do duplicate work, actually. Mm -hmm. work yeah. actually. I would much prefer to invest my time in Debian rather than package and maintain things just for our own use. Yeah, that, that's what we try to do most of the time. So we, we already have Redmine, so everything that Redmine depends on is there. Uh, there's people uh, working on Diaspora. So I think Diaspora is quite close to finishing. So they have 80 or 90% of the dependencies package, which, which is quite a lot because it was an absurd number of packages. And we have also people working on GitLab. I think GitLab should be at 60% or something. So everything that's in the dependency chain of those applications is already available. Plus the stuff that Chef needs, the Vagrant needs, the Puppet needs, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think we are, Jess is going to be really nice. Um, I think we have five minutes left, is that correct? Yeah. Five minutes? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, uh, on that matter, uh, Chef, if anybody wants to use Chef, it would need your help. Um, the packages are, I think, very outdated and only unstable. So if you want to use Chef. I, I try to contact the maintainer again and again and again, like three or four times, no answer. Mm. Yeah, I think you need to just hijack them. Well, I think we need to remove the packet at some point. No, 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 no. I, I was Chef. <laughs> wait, wait there. <laughs> I was chef on Wheezy and works just fine. So <laughs> we, we need to fix that. Okay. Uh, 
Does anybody have comments on any of the other items on our list? Does anybody want to work on them? Especially on policy, documentation, um, gem to deb. Yeah, I think gem to deb is mostly very specific points that people just have to look at the BTS and choose bugs to work on. Yeah, I think uh, we don't have to decide now on sprint, but we can discuss over the mailing list. And code review, I think several other people are also work, uh, looking at that for that and other teams. So. The, the plan for ASPEC is to uh, wait after yes. Jesse for 3.0, right? Yes. going to be a, pain, a lot of pain. Yeah. But, but, yeah. Um, but then, being, our being a development dependency, maybe we can just have the two versions there. And it's not ideal, but it's less pain than well, if we have a two package test on every package, at least we will know oh. yep. what is broken, which is good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hmm. okay. We can also, if you want, we can also try to do a rebuild, a mass, like a mass rebuild with a. We could try to do a mass rebuild of every package, depending on LSpec, after upgrading and see also how many breaks. Because we don't have a good estimate right now, right? Mm -hmm. No. No. Yeah, Luca told me that there was still money in the <laughs> Amazon thing that is used to do master okay. build. So. We haven't chosen most of them yet, so it expires at the end of the year. So if you need CPU power. Okay. So maybe. Choose it. Where, where? Yeah, I think that's we, we can upload our spec to experimental and then. Rebuild everything. I think we are. Is there any feedback from IRC? Yeah, there is some feedback on IRC to, uh, for our spec. Um, Caitlin says that. She? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I that's think all. So. Um, she has done uh, a lot of work for packaging our spec 3. Uh, and Cedric says. <coughs> that he expects the mass rebuild to basically um, say that 50% of packages will fail. <laughs> uh, yeah. And Jonas earlier said that he lost track on uh, packaging GitLab. So I guess uh, if you want to see GitLab, then it also needs your help. Uh, yeah. Okay. We are one minute to go, so let's uh, close the session. I think we had very nice feedback. Uh, I don't think the notes reflect that, but then we can always watch the recording later and, and <laughs> taking the appropriate notes. Um, yeah, that's it. So thanks everyone, and um, we are done. Thank you. Uh, yeah. It seems to be useful.